Good evening, everyone, and welcome. My name is Lynn O'Hara. I'm the Director of Programs at National History Day. We're broadcasting tonight from all over the country, but I'm here at our headquarters in College Park, Maryland. And I'd like to say a quick thank you to all of our guests who are here tonight. First off, we've got Chris McGee. He's an archivist at the National Archives in Kansas City. I'm also joined tonight by Elizabeth Dinchel. Elizabeth is an education specialist at the Herbert, Herbert Hoover Presidential Library. I also have with us tonight Naomi Kokian. She is uh, the manager of youth and teacher programs at the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. And finally, we've got Katie Munn. Uh, Katie is the manager of education programs for the White House Historical Association. Our goal tonight is really to give students a transition. We know that a lot of students have done an awful lot of work in research, and we've done some webinars and hangouts and a lot of things to get students thinking about research. Tonight, what we're going to do is kind of transition from doing research into creating projects, kind of in the last stages of research. What's important tonight is that we're going to be answering your questions live throughout the hour. If you look right below my name, we've got our hashtag, NHD Hangouts. Make sure you get the S on the end of that. Go ahead and tweet your questions. Use this hashtag. And our goal tonight is to answer as many of them as possible. So I'll be watching that live and throwing questions out to our experts. So to get things started, I'm actually going to go ahead and start with Katie. We know that one of the things that students are doing is visiting historic sites. And there are literally thousands of historic sites. And I say that, you know, you don't have to be in Washington, D.C. to see one of these. I want to see if you could talk a little bit about things that students should do or think about before they visit one of these sites or museums or locations. Sure. Well, it's always a great idea to start with the site's website. Sometimes historic sites can have tricky hours, so you always want to plan your trip in advance and make sure you're going at a time uh, where you'll be able to see the site. By checking out the website, you can also get an idea of when tours and if tours are offered, any special exhibits that might be going on, directions for getting there, and then usually you'll be able to find a little bit of background information on the site that you're visiting to give you a heads up on its significance and importance. Okay, so let's say I check the time and I talk to my parents and I've got them convinced that Saturday morning we're going to go see this site. When we get there, and we know that we checked to make sure it didn't open until 10 a.m., what kinds of things should you do when you get there? Because you know you only have a limited amount of time and you want to make the most of the time that you have. So what tips do you have? Right, well, if there is an intro video or any orientation exhibit, definitely check that out. It's a great way to uh, get some context on the site that you're visiting. And then also, if there's a tour, take it. Uh, tour guides at historic sites have a wealth of information to share with you, and it's a wonderful way to learn more about the site. So while you're there, you know that sometimes you know, students might be put off by that tour because, you know, they know some of it or they've heard some of it. But what are some things that students can do to maximize their experience and their trip to any one of these locations? Definitely. Well, if you have a chance, uh, tell the tour guide about your project, what you're researching, uh, what you're thinking about for National History Day. That this way, the tour guide might be able to tailor their tour uh, as you go along and give you some information that really ties into what you're researching. You can also ask questions if there's something specific that you want to know about. Or if you just want to start with something simple, what can this historic site uh, tell us about history? That's a wonderful place to start. Even the smallest historic site connects to larger themes uh, and uh, other historical trends. And uh, come prepared. Have a notepad, pencil to take notes as you're going on your tour. So if you hear something interesting that you want to follow up on, you can make a note of it to do later. And bring a camera, but always check to make sure that photos are allowed before you begin snapping pictures. Same with video. It's always a good rule of thumb to ask permission, not just for artifacts, but if you're taking pictures of people. Most people will say yes. Most people want to be involved and engaged in your research, but you just want to make sure you have that permission first. So if, if you want to learn more, what are some strategies that might help you get a little more in-depth and a little more information? Right. Well, if 
you know, you should be aware that your tour guide or people working at the historic site might have might not have time for an interview or an in-depth interview in that moment. But if you're interested in talking to someone to receive more information, definitely ask uh, who would be a good person to contact. Or you can look on the website and find an email for someone to contact at a later date to go back for uh, that interview or for more questions. Also, ask uh, the people working at the site if they have any recommendations of other books or resources to look into. They might point you in the direction of some really interesting sources. Absolutely. Remember, they're experts and they tend to really love whatever the topic is at the place that they work. Yeah. Um, oftentimes, too, they've read an awful lot, too. You never know what recommendations they might have um, in terms of websites, in terms of videos, in terms of movies, documentaries, lots of different resources there. Katie, here's a question. Um, this is something you mentioned earlier, but a student was asked a question in registration about they're looking to other sites and how can a site provide historic context for a time period? This student was looking at Helen Keller, but really any of the leaders that students are looking at. If they can go to a site connected with them, how can you explain this idea of context and how a site can help teach that? Absolutely. Uh, there are many ways a historic site can give you context. If you're going to a birthplace of a leader, you're going to find out information on what influenced them growing up, what their family life was like, uh, what they did in the town they grew up in, how the issues that were happening in that town impacted their world view, and a lot of the times things that they saw or observed or were a part of in their child childhood went on to influence them as adults, so it can kind of give you those a look at their early days. Also with uh, sites, Things that are going on at these local sites, things that are going on, again, on the local level are connecting to broader issues across the country. Whether it's a topic like prohibition or protest, you're going to find uh, examples on a small local level as well as the larger level. And a lot of times, I've always said that I think the best History Day projects are those that take a national trend and connect it at a local level. Oftentimes when you do that, you can get to the best primary sources. Definitely. Here's another kind of presidential question for you, since you guys are the White House Historical Association. A student posted a question asking, saying that he wants to study Ronald Reagan as his leader. And his teacher is encouraging him to focus on an aspect of the presidency, but he really wants to do the entirety of Ronald Reagan's two terms as president. What advice would you give this student from the perspective of your organization? Excellent. Well, Ronald Reagan is a big topic. As you said, there's two terms, uh, and there's a lot that happened in those two terms. So I think your teacher's idea of focusing on an aspect of that presidency is probably a good idea. It'll help you stay focused and really allow you to do an in-depth exploration of examples of Ronald Reagan's leadership. Whether you want to look at things he was doing internationally with the Cold War, uh, or looking closer to home with how he handled uh, what his economic leadership was like. I think you can really focus in on a topic, dig into it, and wow us with the research that you'll find. Absolutely. And I always tell students, you know, keep in mind with, you know, a lot of these presidents, there's entire libraries. There's a library in California devoted just to Ronald Reagan. And, you know, if they can't answer that question easily, it's going to be really hard for you to do in 500 words or a 2,500 word paper or a 10 minute documentary. So the idea of, with a lot of these topics, is picking the aspect you want to focus on. And we'll come back and talk about that a little later when we talk about thesis statements. Thanks, Katie. What I'd like to do is turn things over now to Chris McGee. Chris is an archivist at the National Archives in Kansas City. And one of Hello. the things... Hi, Chris. One of the things that students are starting to do at this point in the game is sometimes do a little more advanced research at these archival sites, whether they be through the National Archives, maybe they're a state archive in their area, or even a local historical society. So I was curious if you could talk to us a little bit about National Archives and the Kansas City facility where you work um, and tell us a little bit more of what an archive is and how it's different from a library. Yeah. Um, I'd really love to do that. Um, so like Lynn said, I'm a Christopher McGee with the National Archives at Kansas City. I'm going to do a screen share of a presentation that I appear to have closed. Nope, it's still open. Okay, good. Um, and in this, we're, we're going to really talk about a few things. Or it's, I'm having, let's see. 
having some, I'll just start anyways and I'll see if I can figure this out. So one of the things we're going to really talk about right now are we're going to learn a little bit about how archives really are at all different levels of uh, our government organizations and not only government but they go into private entities as well. So I'm a member of the National Archives and we have offices uh, in 14 cities that relate to federal records but we also have 14 presidential libraries. We have offices in Seattle, Los Angeles, Atlanta, Boston, New York, and Kansas City where I am. And all of these organizations focus on specific unique records and these hold the primary sources uh, of the federal government. And it's really exciting to see um, all that we have. Um, and again, I'm really sorry for the technology issues. I don't That's know why okay. this it's, is... It's not a hangout if there's not a technology glitch. Exactly. Um, Can you talk a little bit about um, how certain archives hold certain records but not all the records and, and why that's actually, that is? That's a, that's really, that's a really good uh, thing to talk about. So with archives, collect unique historical documents. So the National Archives at Kansas City collects records created by federal agencies in North and South Dakota, Minnesota, Nebraska, Iowa, and records from Maine. We don't collect records from California. We collect records of the Central Plains. And the records that we collect are only at the federal level. And so what we have are records of the Army Corps of Engineers. We have records of the National Park Service. We have records created by the federal courts. And all of these things are unique to each archival facility. And while we're the National Archives, we don't have everything nationally. Um, state archives are a tremendous resource. We don't have a facility in Montana. So if you're a student out there in Billings, contact the Montana State Historical Society. Contact University of Montana. Um, universities are a great resource as well. Um, for instance, if you're doing leadership and legacy, state governors are a really great topic. Those records won't be at the National Archives. They will be wherever the state says governor records go. Sometimes that's the state archives. Sometimes governors have the right to keep their own personal papers and they can go to uh, play, uh, institutions that they want. Can you talk about if a student is going to go to an archive, if there's something in their area, what kinds of things should they do before they get there to make sure that their visit is successful? The one thing um, I think you know, that was already kind of mentioned with the historical site is it's, is plan ahead. Archives are similar to libraries in that we are collections of information where people can come and access them. One of the big differences between archives, though, is the public can't go into an archival area where we keep our records. Because they're so unique, um, it takes some time to pull and retrieve the records. Just to kind of conceptualize the amount of records the National Archives at Kansas City has, if you were to lay box by box in a line, it would cover over 700 football fields for each box that we have in our holdings. It's 70,000... 70,000 cubic feet of records, and that's just a lot. And so when you're coming to actually do primary source research in person, uh, always set up an appointment. Contact an archival uh, collections and be like, hey, this is my topic. What do you have on this? Because topics will spread across a number of many things. Um, say, for instance, uh, and one of the big topics we like to talk about in Kansas City is Walt Disney. Walt Disney, um, you know, we know him as the Walt Disney Company. We know him as this leader and popular culture. But did you know that before he became the Walt Disney of Hollywood, he, he lived in Missouri? And in fact, he was a Kansas City Art Institute instructor, and he actually created Laugh-O-Gram Studios. Laugh-O-Gram Studios did not, was not as successful as his next venture and went bankrupt. The National Archives at Kansas City has his bankruptcy case file that we can make available for free online. And 
and it has all this complexity. So we have his bankruptcy case file. Well, once he became famous, he sued people because they were violating his copyright. So we also have additional copyright violations in our holdings. And so when you contact the archives and you say, I'm researching this person, we can piece together all of the information that we have. And that way, when you come and you do your visit, you get the most bang for your buck in terms of your research time, and you can really get the records that you need. Excellent. What kinds of things, when a student goes to an archive, what would it look like? What's it, the experience going to be like while they're there? So that can, also, that can actually vary quite a bit. Um, generally, when you go to view, uh, go to an archives, you're not allowed to bring in pens because pens make permanent marks, and if you use that on your archival records, that can create problems with determining who made this mark. So most archives only allow pencils, and you can usually... Um, they usually will give you scratch paper. Um, so that's just because archives tend to be very protective of their holdings because they're so unique. Generally, you will be sitting at a desk, um, usually a pretty good-sized desk, probably about four feet across uh, with about three or so feet of uh, space uh, horizontally so that you can lay out your box, and then you open your folder, and you go document through document. Um, there will often be someone at a desk, very similar to a reference desk at a library, who can help answer your questions um, and help guide you to more sources. Okay. What do you think, and what in your experience as an archivist, is the biggest mistake that students make when they come to an archive? And I would say this is just the biggest mistake that I see in general. Um, from primary students through graduate students through seasoned researchers is showing up unannounced. Um, just simply because when you have uh, hundreds or potentially thousands of feet of material, if you show up unannounced, uh, that kind of makes the archivist scramble. And then they don't necessarily have time to go through all of our finding aids, which are what we use and we give the public uh, to find material. Um, because if we have so much information, we don't have page-by-page -page descriptions. We're lucky if we even have a folder-level description. Um, usually it's at the box level, so it takes some time to go through and really locate materials. So if you show up unannounced, that can cause problems. Luckily, the National Archives has a lot of information online. Um, and through our online catalog, a number of resources are already available for free. And you don't, and these are primary sources. You may be accessing them electronically. They may be copies of the actual paper record, but if it's an electronic resource you find online, if it's still that Walt Disney bankruptcy case file, that's still the primary source that you can use in your article. That's a really good point. Um, in terms of kind of maximizing this opportunity, a couple questions that have come in. I'll just remind everybody who's listening, please go ahead and tweet your questions to us using the hashtag NHDHangouts. We'd love to hear what our live viewers are watching, and I know there's a lot of live viewers right now. Um, with student ask questions, sometimes, Chris, the students might be working with a leader who's controversial who's not very well liked and maybe has done some pretty bad things in history. What are some ways that you could suggestions you can give researchers working with these more controversial topics in history? That's a really good question and that's something we encounter a lot. And what I'll say to this, archives aren't in the truth business. We are not in the right or the wrong business. We are in the records business. Does the record state that person X did thing Y? Um, what it's not up to us to determine uh, whether something is right or wrong. That is up to uh, forces outside of us. So when you come and you're writing about something that's controversial, the most important thing is to really stick to the facts, stick to what the evidence supports. Um, when you, s I think we can agree, genocide's not a good thing. And when you're talking about something that's that terrible. It can be easy to let um, emotionally impactful language creep in, and it's really you really need to do what the site write as the sources say, and not add to them. And if you stick strictly to what they say, 
you're going to get some really good information and you can really delve into some very interesting topics. Okay, here's another question from a student. A student says he's uh, researching John F. Kennedy. And mm -hmm. he had asked, you know, could we help him find people to help him with John F. Kennedy research. There's a lot of students who are maybe on the earlier stages of research. What kinds of suggestions do you have from National Archives perspective about researching somebody like John Kennedy? That's a really great question too. Um, so as was previously mentioned, we have the presidential library system. Um, each president from Hoover through George W. Bush and soon to be Barack Obama have libraries that are part of the National Archives. The JFK Library is in Boston, Massachusetts, where coincidentally there's also the National Archives of Boston that collects records from the agencies in Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Vermont, and Maine. Um, and on top of that, John F. Kennedy was also in the military, so we have a military records center in St. Louis that will have aspects of his military career. So really, if you're doing JFK, go and highlight... Uh, Hit, hit up the JFK library and see what topics they have. Hit up their website. They're going to have great information that's already available online. And, you know, when you have these very famous people, they're going to have a historic site, and often these historic sites will have research collections on site that you might be able to view if you set up a visit and you tell them what you're interested in. I think that's a really good point to end on in your section, that we have found that there are lots of archivists and education specialists and local historians and people who are really willing to help students. It's just really important to give people a heads up, to ask questions, and to try to do so in a way that's effective but also respectful of everybody's time. I can tell you if you send an email and says, say, you know, my homework's due tomorrow and can you answer these three questions for me? I can almost guarantee a lot of our experts don't answer back, especially when those emails come in at 11 p.m., midnight, 1 a.m. I've gotten those here at History Day sometimes. But speaking of talking to people, I'm going to turn things over to Naomi Kokian. Uh, Naomi works at the National Museum of American History on the Mall, a place that I like to jokingly refer to as the mothership and one of my favorite places in Washington, D.C. And I know that oftentimes you guys get a lot of requests for interviews. Do, Can you yeah. talk a little bit at, we know that there's a lot of students looking for interviews. Uh, first off, I will say there is no rule about interviews. They are not required. Uh, there are no magic number. I have heard lots of internet rumors from one to five to I heard ten, which I thought would be a really <laughs> impressive project. Uh, but can you start off, Naomi, and talk a little bit about how students might be able to find someone to interview for their History Day project? Sure, I'd be glad to. And you know, I'll, I guess I'll say that there are two different types of interviews you might be doing. Um, one would be sort of a primary account, uh, talking with someone who participated in the event that you're researching, um, who has personal knowledge uh, you know, of this time period or, again, the event. Um, so that's a primary source account. Um, or a secondary account, so you're talking to an expert who studies this period, um, this moment in time, um, who can then give you kind of perspective on um, the interpretations of that period, their own interpretations based on the, um, on the evidence, those sorts of things. So those are two different sort of interviews, and you'd go about them differently. Um, so I'll talk about each one. Um, so for the oral history uh, sort of idea, um, you know, talking with someone who experienced the, uh, the event or the time period, um, I'd say first, you'd be well. Go to your local communities. I guess I'll, I'll say that, um, and really think broadly about um, who would be a, a, an important person or useful person to talk to. I think sometimes, you know, it's easy to think, well, I need to talk to a famous person, someone I've read about necessarily. But there are lots of people um, who experienced the, you know, the events that we're studying um, that can speak about that from their own uh, perspective and, and might have really compelling stories that could be really useful for your project. So. You know, when I say go to your communities, you can start in your immediate circles. So talk to your parents, uh, your caregivers, your family, and um, as well as your teachers um, and people in your school, just to see. You know, do you know anyone who um, lived during the '68 riots, for example? Um, and you know, see what they what they can offer if they know someone who might know someone. Um, from there, I'd say you know, go to your local organizations, um, and so that could be local chapters of national organizations. Um, or just local community organizations who may have a, a good sense of kind of who's in your community um, and what their experiences have been. So, you know, if they're if you're looking for a veteran to talk to, 
you can go to the VA website and you can find lots of uh, organizations related to the VA or VH um, offices or go to the VFW, the Veterans of Foreign uh, Wars, so there are lots of local chapters of that organization as well, so there are ways to um, to look for people who have those experiences. If you're thinking about the civil rights movement, for example, you know, lived experiences, um, perhaps a local chapter of the NAACP you might be able to go to, um, but again, sort of look around to your community organizations and just ask them, you know, is there someone um, here or that you know who might be able to talk to me about this kind of, this project? Um, you could search your local news, see if there was, you know, if you're looking at an event that's been covered um, in an anniversary or something, you could see if someone's been interviewed and then kind of try to track them down. Um, also just, you know, uh, we've already heard a little bit about going to um, local uh, historical societies or um, places like that, I think those are really good places to go just to find out who's been interviewed. Um, a lot of uh, state museums, local museums have oral history, um, oral histories already uh, recorded, um, and so you can look to those first, but then also see if maybe there's, some of those people might be interesting to interview again to find out more, to follow up on something that they've already um, talked about. So I think those are some ways to think about finding people who experienced an event um, who can speak in that way. Um, but the kind of requests that we get are, you know, for experts. So, you know, understandably people want to talk to the curators about um, events in American history, this being the National Museum of American History. Um, and I think the thing to think about for looking for, the, for expert interviews is just to realize that um, these experts do have specialties. And so you want to be sure that you're going, you're finding a particular person who has a particular specialty that will be useful to you. Um, and I think it's important too to look in your immediate area to see who's available. So you've heard already that from Chris that you know local um, colleges and universities are really great resources, and I'm just echoing that. I think you know one thing you can do is go to the website of the history department at a local college or university and see what people are studying. Their bios are listed there. Their research interests are there. See if there's someone who's working on the topic that you're interested in. Then I'd say. Find out what they've written about the topic, read some of it. Um, they'll be very flattered to know that you've done that, but also it's really important to, um, to kind of know what they've said already so that you can follow up and ask really in-depth questions, specifically about what they would specialize in and might know. Um, so there are also, again, museums are a good, great place to go. I'll just say that, you know, if you're coming to a museum, um, think about, you know, what is it about the museum that might be useful to you? So, uh, a lot of times curators are excited to talk about the objects in the collections here, so um, are there artifacts that you know the museum has, and a lot of us have those artifacts already on our websites, um, that you want to know more about or that could help your project. Um, and then I would say, you know, try to figure out if there's a specific curator whose, again, research interests, which are often on their website, um, relate to something that you're studying. Um, and then I'd say reach out to them as specifically as you can or, you know, find a general email address but say I know that you that this person works here and they're studying this and I have these specific questions um, that I'd love to know more about and, and to be able to talk to you about so um, hopefully that's a good overview of how you might think about those two different types of, of interviews excellent and you know a lot of times you know we have to keep in mind primary source interviews aren't always available especially as you do history that goes back further now I know one of the things that you have to think about if you do manage to schedule an interview with someone is what are you going to ask because I can give you a tip here if you talk to a to a curator to a professor to an archivist and you say okay tell me everything you know about the women's <laughs> suffrage movement that's not gonna go very well and I know that sometimes students get nervous and that's the first question that blurts out of their mouth but what are some good ways to ask very specific questions that can really help your NHD project yeah and I'll say you know we do um, we do get those kinds of questions here and and it's um, it's hard because I think you know I just uh, you know in the end have to say we need to know more specifically what you want to know and so I think for experts you know as I said finding out what they've already said about this topic um, and you know knowing a bit about your topic having the, the expert interview not be the first stage of your of your research this being sort of towards the end where you're really filling in holes and there, there are questions that you've you've read things about and you just you haven't found a good answer to those um, those are the sorts of things that are good topics of conversation for um, for for the experts, for the scholars. So, or if there's something that you've read that they've written, 
um, that you feel like, well, you know, there's there's just more I want to know about this, or you know, this left kind of something unanswered for me. Um, following up on those details again will will um, I think get you the best interview um, with with a scholar. Um, so read what they've already written um, and make sure that that the interviews are really filling in some some of those smaller holes as opposed to kind of being on the front end of the research. Um, for oral histories, you know, I'd say well, there are lots of great um, resources out there about how to do oral histories, and I'll say oralhistory.org is one of those places. Um, but you know. You want to begin by um, just asking them a little bit about themselves, get let them uh, get, sort of get comfortable. Um, you want to make sure that you're establishing, you're opening up by saying, recording where you are um, when you're doing this, um, but also being really open-ended. I think for the scholars, interestingly, I would say you want to be more specific, ask more specific questions. For oral history interviews, you want to give them space to kind of talk about their experience, so being a little bit more open-ended is important. However, I'm no, not saying ever ask a yes or no question. <laughs> you, you always want to be have space for conversation, but um, but make sure that for the scholars who you really dug in, and, and for the, oral, um, the people that you're interviewing for the oral history, you want to know something about them as well, but you also want to make sure that you're giving them kind of time and, and space to, um, to speak about their experiences. Um, so, but again, I think there are great resources out there to guide you on oral histories um, beyond what, what I can offer here. Excellent. When we talk about these interviews, there are always some logistical considerations. If someone's willing to give you some time, what are some things that you should think out about as a courtesy to that expert who's willing to sit down and talk with you? Okay, yeah, and I think um, I'll talk about things that you can do, and I think they apply both for over the phone and for in-person interviews. Some of them more so for one than the other, but but they're important to think about whether you're doing this in person or um, or over the phone. I mean, for one thing, I'll, I'll start off by saying the hard part is getting the interview, right? Getting the attention of the person, getting the time. Um, but once they've given you the time, you've got that space. So, um, you know, relax and, and breathe and um, and make the best use of it that you can and enjoy the conversation because I think you've you've really sort of gone over the um, one of the bigger hurdles which is kind of identifying the person and and making sure that you can um, have time with them but beyond that I'll say um, especially over the phone but also in person you know you want to be um, friendly make sure you introduce yourself say hello um, and make sure that you have your questions written out it can be really easy to um, kind of get nervous and um, and to ask questions that you know aren't as specific or as useful for your conversation, if you've prepared them in advance, if you've really thought them through, talk them over with your teacher, um, and have them in front of you, it'll be a lot easier. Um, that said, you also want to, you know, be flexible enough to kind of let the conversation go. If there are places that you want to follow up, you should. Um, this is the time to do it. Um, but have those questions with you so that you don't sort of get lost um, in, in the conversation. Um, you probably want to bring someone with, someone with you or have someone with you on the phone. And if you're on the phone, make sure that you're um, that you have a really strong connection. Um, it might be helpful to be um, in an office or at school uh, on a speaker phone and have someone there who can help you take notes, um, but also someone with you if you're in person, again, to kind of keep track of the conversation. Um, if you're going to record, which is really a good idea to do, just because it's hard to catch all of those things, you need to Make sure that that's okay with them beforehand, um, but then also tell them as soon as you're turning on the recorder and then when you turn it off. Um, have some water with you. Um, and if you're doing this in person, it's a nice thing to do to offer them some water too, especially because they're going to be probably the ones doing a lot of the talking. Um, but it'll help both of you if you have some of that. Um, so I think also make sure that you're in a space, whether it's um, in person or by phone, that's quiet where you can really have a conversation, where you can sit for a while, um, you know, find a place that's that's good for both of you if it's in person, but just make sure that you have an, um, a space where you're really going to sort of be able to make the most of the conversation um, and have the best quality audio if you're recording. Absolutely. So here's a question. What should you do after the interview is over? So, okay, make sure that you thank them um, as you're leaving, but also a thank you note goes a long way, I think. Um, but you'd also be surprised that, you know, they want to know what your project was, how it turned out, you know, what your experience was. So send them a follow-up, give them a snapshot of, of what, how they, how you used that interview in your project, um, what your experience with National History Day was. They'll be really excited, and I know that just from experience here, um, that the people who 
who have spent time with researchers for National History Day are really excited to see what the project was and, and how it all went. So um, don't be afraid to share that as well. It's always a nice idea to send a copy of that project, whether it's the URL for your website or a snapshot of your exhibit board. It's, you know, it's always a nice way to say thank you, and it never hurts to say thank you to somebody. Okay, for our final segment tonight, and again, keep questions coming. We're going to do some questions at the end here. Twitter, hashtag NHD Hangouts. I'm going to turn things over to Elizabeth Dinshell. Elizabeth works at the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, and we uh, spend a lot of time talking about thesis statements. So to get things started, first off, can you explain, Elizabeth, what a thesis statement is and why we use them in History Day? What's the point of a thesis statement? Sure. Um, so in addition to being at the National Archives, um, I, I'm a degreed historian. So I can tell you that we use thesis, statement in his, thesis statements in historic writing all the time. And so one of the main things we're trying to do in National History Day is to make sure that you understand the craft of history. And part of that is going to be formulating your thesis. And so when we talk about our thesis, it's our main argument, the main point that you're going to make in your project, however that is you're going to present it. But it's not going to just be a statement of fact like we were talking about JFK earlier, so we can use him as an example. So we wouldn't say JFK was the president during the Bay of Pigs. What we would want to say was something along the lines of JFK showed exemplary leadership during the space race, or that his man on the moon speech changed the course of space exploration. Uh, and you're going to need evidence to support that. But your thesis statement, right off the bat, when you hand that process paper to the judges, is going to tell them what your entire project is about and the trajectory of your research or the direction that your research is going in. I think that's a, an important point because one of the things that a thesis statement will do is separate projects because yeah. chances are there will be multiple projects on the same topic, whether it's, you know, President Reagan, whether it's about um, Hammurabi and the ancient Mesopotamians, whatever the topic is. But your thesis helps to give your focus and your twist. Basically, it's you saying, this is the part that I'm going to argue, and this is what sets my research and my work apart from other people who might have similar people or even similar topics within the people that they're studying. Can you talk about some of the elements of a good thesis statement? A good thesis statement should have these things in it. Sure. Um, the first thing we're going to look at is for a good analysis and a good argument. Um, and a lot of times when we think of argument, we think about like arguing with our siblings or our friends or our parents. But that's not what we mean here. We want to see a solid analysis of your research um, and, and what your conclusion is about it. We want to see that it's supported by evidence. So you can claim anything. But until you support it by evidence, um, I like to say it's kind of like a scientific method thing. It's a hypothesis. But what are, what's going to make it a thesis is that support from the evidence. And you really have to value that evidence when you make your thesis statement. Um, a lot of times I read thesis statements from students and I say to them, this is a great start and this looks like a very interesting argument you're going to have to support this with evidence. So you can't just say something that you just believe. You have to support it with evidence. We want to see that historic impact. How was history different after this person's leadership? Um, this is a great theme this year because we have the legacy element of it. So that's really a great place to put in the historic impact. But in any historic writing, we need to see the historic impact, the ripples, the big effect that happens from this event or this person or even this historic place. Um, something else I like to see in our thesis statements is the theme. This year it's leadership and legacy. So your thesis needs to include both elements. It needs to include leadership and legacy. Sometimes there's three parts to the theme. Your thesis will need to contain all three parts so that we understand that you have evidence and an argument that will talk about the entire theme, not just one part of it. 
I think that's a really good point. I think sometimes what separates a good History Day project from a really, really good History Day project is making the connections to the theme. I think sometimes students make a mistake in that they assume that the judges will get it. And there's no way to assume that they absolutely positively will get it. You have to make it clear. And that's where the argumentation comes in. And I think sometimes it's tough because of the word limits and the time limits. And that's where some editing needs to be done so that you make sure you get that analysis in there. Spend less time describing and more time arguing. Uh, we have all seen, I know you've served as a judge for History Day at different levels. I've worked as a judge and a teacher with History Day. What do some bad thesis statements sound like? What do you want to avoid if you're a student working on this right now? So when we, we think about the good and the bad, and, and we can separate them as judges when, when we're handed that process paper, um, one thing I, I beg all of the national history students in the country to do is to run your spell check. If you have a misspelling in your thesis statement, <laughs> right off the bat you've discredited yourself. Please, please, please spell check. Um, so you want to make sure it's grammatically sound. Um, even work on it with your English teacher or your history teacher to make sure that it makes sense, that it flows, that it's not awkward. Um, one of the things I see is students try to combine it into one sentence. Your thesis statement does not need to be one sentence. Please do not try to make it one sentence. It will be a, a very bad run-on sentence. Um, sometimes we see a synopsis of research instead of an argument. And what I mean by synopsis is when you start off by saying, my project is about, or I decided to choose this person because, instead of starting off with an argument. And a good place to see and read some really strong examples of thesis statements is when you're working in your secondary sources, and you go to the introduction of the book, read that introduction, you will find their thesis statement in there. Um, usually it's in the first or the last paragraph of the introduction, but it will give you a solid view of what a, a historian writes for uh, a thesis statement. Um, something else we'll see is that it doesn't address the theme, and if it's not going to argue for the theme, it's not really a thesis statement for National History Day. So make sure you have that tie back to the theme. Well, I think that, that why is really important. You don't just want to say Alice Paul was a leader, but Alice yeah. Paul's leadership was effective in attaining her goals because. Another good way to think about it is this is the shortest elevator pitch you get. So if you just read your thesis statement to someone, whether it's one sentence, three, maybe even four sentences, if it absolutely has to be, I wouldn't go too, too much longer than that. But does someone have an idea of what your project's going to be about? Do they get it? If they get it, good. If they're a little confused, if they can't follow you, if they're not sure where you're going, then that's a good sign that maybe you need to work on that just a little bit more. What are some of these other kind of myths or misconceptions or internet rumors about thesis statements that you've encountered? Sure. Um, so one of the things that we hear a lot is that the thesis statement has to be just one sentence. Um, and I think some of that comes from our form writing that we get in English that doesn't really apply in history. Um, especially for a multi-part theme, like, like I said, this year's is two parts, we're going to see at least three sentences. Um, we're going to hear your main argument, we're going to hear about leadership, and we're going to hear about legacy. Uh, and we'll be looking for that. When you get to your three-part themes in the future or, or from the past, they might be four sentences. It, it might be about a paragraph. We don't want to see a paper for a thesis statement. It needs to be concise. And I think the word count will help you to keep it concise, but it does not have to be one sentence. Um, it should not restate the facts. We're looking for those arguments and we're looking for how you're going to set up your project. Your evidence will support whatever your thesis is. It's not to, to highlight that in your thesis statement. Um, the other thing we see is formulas or forms. Um, my person is a leader because their legacy is, and that's not the best way to do it. It should 
flow from your research. And I think one of the last things is that once you write a thesis, a lot of students think you have to stick to your thesis. And that's not true. The entire time you're researching, every time you find something new, your research is going to take twists and turns and, and maybe take you in an unexpected direction. You should be prepared to refine and change your thesis to make it match your evidence better or to make sure that evidence is supporting it. So sometimes we might think one thing and start off saying, this is my thesis and I'm going to have evidence to support it. And then when we get into the research, we find evidence doesn't support our thesis and now we have to change it. And that's perfectly acceptable. Historians do that all the time. Um, we find ourselves starting on one side of the fence and finishing on the other. And that's okay. That's what research is supposed to do. So let your evidence and your research guide your thesis statement, not the other way around. And also, we know that a lot of students and teachers might start with a form or a worksheet, and there's nothing wrong with that, but make sure in the end that you make it unique to you, because I think that's really something that's important. Um, let's go. I'm going to toss a couple questions out. I've got some for Elizabeth and some for Naomi. Please keep your questions coming. Uh, we know that you're out there watching, and we'd love to make sure you get your chance to ask your question live. Uh, Elizabeth, first question for you. Can you talk a little bit about... Uh, one of the questions we got is, can you do really well in History Day using either a state or a local history topic as opposed to a national or international topic? Yes. Um, there's a few advantages, I think, to using a local or a state topic. Um, one of those is that your judges may not know a lot, so they'll be more likely to be engaged with your topic because they're learning something. Um, also, you have more accessibility of, of records. Uh, I'm in Iowa, so if I want to research JFK like we were talking about, it might be harder for me. Not everything might be digital. I can't be in the archives. But if I want to do Herbert Hoover, it's right here for me. Or if I wanted to do John Deere, we just had a John Deere museum open, I would be able to go out there and do research. Um, local archives also have local experts. That means when you do that interview, when you do that historic site visit, you always have the option to go back. You don't always have that option with someone who's far away. You can also dedicate extra trips to being somewhere if it's a local or a state topic. And we don't always get that if you're far away or if it's a national topic. Um, another advantage you have is that there may not be anything to compare you to. Uh, JFK, I might get six entries on JFK, and that's not bad. There is going to be phenomenal JFK entries. But if I have a local topic that doesn't have anybody else doing it, they're the benchmark. They only have to beat themselves. <laughs> Excellent. Naomi, I have a question for you. A student asked the question mm -hmm. um, that she is studying the, uh, the, the Marie Curie. Now, obviously, Marie Curie died, unfortunately, based on her science. Um, and so this student has arranged to interview with a radiologist. So she's looking with somebody who really works with the legacy mm -hmm. of this scientific person. Can you talk a little bit about what kinds of questions or in which way she might direct her questions so that they're effective? Sure. I mean, I think uh, that's a really great and creative way to think about um, an interview. And um, you know, the, the thing that I would suggest is that you just focus on what your interviewee specializes in, what they can really answer, right? So radiologists might have a, know a lot about Marie Curie, but probably you're better off asking them how, you know, things related to their specialty and their research or their, you know, line of work. So, you know, how do x-rays work? Um, how have they changed over time? Perhaps they might know that. Um, what are the effects of radiation? I mean, those sorts of things will be useful for you as you are doing your project and kind of writing about Marie Curie's life, and those are the kinds of questions that are likely to be ones that um, this person is really expert in and can help you uh, answer. Okay. Uh, Naomi, while well, I have you another question, some students have posted asking who they should interview and how do they find reliable sources. Students are researching everyone from Abraham Lincoln to Milton Hershey. Um, can you give some suggestions on how to know whether someone is a reliable interview source? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I sort of jumped to conclusions there in, in my um, when I was talking about experts in that, 
you know, I think we're, we're looking at people who have published on the topic in, uh, you know, either have book length uh, pieces published by, you know, well-known publishers or, um, you know, university presses or things like that. People have been published in, in major um, uh, scholarly uh, magazines, peer-reviewed journals, um, or, you know, in national papers or things like that. Um, someone who, you know, has has shown that there are other, uh, that they have, um, they've done extensive research. Um, this is a this is really a specialty of theirs, um, and that you know perhaps they have some recognition from um, the larger academic community. So I think those are the things I would look for when it comes to scholarship. That said, I mean you know you don't have to come to the Smithsonian to find um, uh, you know a scholar an expert. Um, you know there are there are many people who can um, who who fit that that bill. Local museums at colleges, and universities across the country. I mean these are. Um, you know, these are lots of there are lots of places for you to go to find people who are who are considered experts in the in their field. Excellent. And one of the things that sometimes students will want to do is when they do an interview is they might want to film. And obviously, like we talked before, if they have permission to mm -hmm. film, can you give any tips to any students who are setting up to film an interview with the goal of including it, whether it be in their website or their documentary? Sure. I mean, I'd say, you know, just think about those logistical issues even more carefully. So if you're filming, um, you want to, you really need great video. So you want to make sure that your lighting is good, that it's bright, you can really see your subject. Um, also think about what your background is. What is that going to look like? Um, is there a good setting for, for you to have this conversation? Um, you know, think about how, you know, have the camera such that the person's looking into the camera. Um, those sorts of things, and make sure your audio is really good too. I mean, you—that's helpful and important for um, for all kinds of interviews, but especially for um, you know, if this is going to be part of a documentary, you want to make sure that your audio and video is really clear and engaging, so that people can—it's comprehensible um, and it's compelling. I think that's a really good point. I always tell students you should never test out your video equipment or your audio equipment on site. Mm -hmm. Do a dummy interview. Put grandma in front mm -hmm. and interview her as practice. It's always good to do a practice round before you do a real round because, like you said, you might not be able to go back and re-record or do a retake. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth, here's a question for you. Uh, one of the things that a student asked is, how do I go ahead and cite a visit to either a museum or an archive or a historic site in my annotated bibliography? Um, that's a really good question that I spend a lot of time working on bibliographies with students. It's going to depend on what what you did and, and where you went. Um, did you interview somebody? Because you're going to cite that as an interview uh, like Naomi was just talking about and whether or not they're secondary or primary depends on if they were there or if they're an expert or a family member. Um, if you visit an archive and you're citing the actual paperwork that you used or the photographs or the recordings, you're going to cite the facility and you can ask the archivist or if you're at a library, the reference librarian, how you're going to cite this. And when you get to your annotation part, it's really important. I, I look at it as a judge, and I think a lot of judges do, why you decided to use this source, um, what made it important, why was it a primary or secondary source, and how did it help your, your project overall. If you visit a historic site, like we talked about, you can cite that historic site as a place you went, and then write in that annotation how that historic site helped you to build context or helped you to build a different part of your project. But if you interview a tour guide, make sure you cite that tour guide and the, that interview that you had with them in your secondary source section. Excellent. So it really depends on what you find, not just where you went. Exactly. Here's a question. We've got about one more minute. Last chance for Twitter questions to come in. But I have a question for anybody on the panel. Whoever wants it, it's yours. And we might get a couple different answers to this one. Um, one of the things that students are starting to transition is from research to actually starting their projects, whether it's building an exhibit board or starting to create a documentary. So my question is, how do you know when research is done and it's time to start on project creation, aside from the fact that you had your teacher tell you that you have to start, but what are some of the triggers and the ways to know to move on? 
Well, I can start off with this. The research is never done if you're interested in the topic. Um, and you can keep going and going and going. I would say once you feel you have a coherent argument, once you really feel that you're, of all the research, if you can condense it down to whatever your word or time limit is, if you feel that you've really told the story you want to tell in terms of your research, then you can really start synthesizing that down and putting your thoughts and your research into words. Yeah, here at the Hoover, we call it right-sizing your topic. So when you've right-sized it into something digestible and you can put it into your word limit or your time limit for your performance or documentary, then you're about there. You're, you're very close to being there. And you should be able to answer and kind of predict what kind of questions you're going to field from the judges as well. Excellent. Elizabeth, one other question just came in over Twitter. Um, one of the questions that we get a lot is well, how do you deal with a topic when you're looking at something in ancient history or medieval history where there aren't as many primary sources or they aren't as accessible? They might be in a different language, harder to get to. What are some tips or what's kind of the judge's perspective on those projects? Okay, um, I'll give you some tips for that. I've, I've had that question asked a lot this year. Um, a lot of the research you're going to use for these is archaeologically based. Um, you need to look at archaeological reports and find out if there's actual artifact evidence that supports um, what you know about the history. A lot of times records are housed at um, churches and the Vatican houses a lot of really important records. Uh, don't discredit them as a really good archival resource. Um, I also suggest finding experts in the area. If you're working in medieval area, areas, there are certainly professors in the United States who are very versed in that. If you're even looking at Latin American or Asian um, or Middle Eastern topics, there are experts in the United States. Um, you can do very simple Google searches and go right to universities. What I suggest you do for that, university professors are very busy. Please work on your questions with a teacher or a mentor. Have them approve them and make sure you CC them on an email that you send so that you're not wasting the professor's time and they can give meaningful feedback towards your project. I think, too, you have to keep in mind, whenever you're doing research, I often get asked the question, how many sources do I need in my annotated bibliography? And I said, there is no magic number because it simply depends. There are certain resources, quite frankly, the more recent your topic and the more close to home, chances are the more resources you'll have available to you. The longer your topic is in the past and the further it is from you, chances are you will have fewer. But there is no magic number. There is no right or wrong answer. And I'm a huge believer in History Day that quality beats quantity. And I think it's important. I've seen bibliographies that are incredibly long. I saw one time that was about 60 pages. I have to be honest with you it wasn't very impressive. You think it would be, but one of the things that I saw is I saw that they found a lot of things, but I wasn't really sure that they had processed or read or learned an awful lot about the topic. And so I think it's really important to consider that you use good sources and that you use your sources well. Um, so what I'm going to do on that point, I'm going to say thank you very, very much to our guests tonight. Thanks Chris McGee from the National Archives at Kansas City, Elizabeth Dinshell from the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library, mm -hmm. Naomi Kokion from the Smithsonian National Museum of American History, and Katie Munn from the White House Historical Association. You guys have done a great job in helping our students transition from research into project creation. And for those of you who are watching, uh, this will be available on nhd.org slash hangouts.htm. And um, we'll leave it up here. We're not going to take it down. Thanks so much, everybody. Have a great night.